Welcome to Witnessing Christ. Witnessing Christ is a truth and love ministry podcast designed to help biblical Christians witness to their Mormon friends, family, and missionaries. For more Bible-based resources, check out tilm.org. We have all kinds of resources to support you, including classes, witnessing scenarios, books, and so much more. Visit tilm.org today. friends this is casey this is john and molly and mark yes you guessed it all four of us are finally in the same room recording a podcast together why are we all recording a podcast together today well we are getting into a part of the new testament where jesus is going to start using more and more parables to teach his disciples and those in the crowd and we thought that we'd just take a a little bit of a pause on the parables before we get into those sections to take a little bit deeper of a dive we know that both for christians and for mormons sometimes understanding and then properly applying the parables to our lives isn't an easy thing by any means. So today we're going to have a a really good conversation first about just how to read the parables, but then how to use the parables in witnessing. First question that we're really just going to talk through today is what are some of the joys and the challenges in our own lives when it's come to reading and applying the parables? Casey, share us just in the past as you've you know, learned the parables in Sunday school or in a Bible class or in worship, what were some of the joys of studying the parables and then maybe some challenges as well? Sure. So I think one of the biggest joys, as we know, parables are an earthly story to showcase a heavenly meaning as we probably learned in Sunday school. Um, but they, they're they really memorable, and i that's what I enjoy about them. They've really stuck with me um, in some ways that maybe some other stories didn't. Um, for example, some of the parables that I think about are uh, the parable of the growing seed, where that to me, you know, coming up around a farming community, that that has a strong meaning in my personal life and in my daily life. I know that the seed is planted, but does the farmer do anything to make it grow besides plant it and then water? Maybe, but no, it's God who makes it grows, who makes it grow. Um, even the prodigal son, I mean, such a beautiful story that we've talked about in our ministry a lot shows the unconditional love of our father and just how beautiful that is. So I think the joys for me really rest in how memorable they are. Yeah. And isn't that one of the kind of fascinating things about storytelling is that that's the reason Jesus used it because it would be memorable, but the way in which they're memorable is that they're a little bit different than the normal story we tell as human beings that we've got, we tell it because we want to make something that's hard easier. Sometimes as Jesus is telling a parable, it actually makes a hard thing even harder And that's kind of the point, isn't it? That sometimes Jesus wanted to make you really dig into it in order to understand it. And then he tells us that it's it's really only through faith that we can understand these. And that really comes to the challenge. So talk to us a little bit about the challenge of studying and then applying the parables. Yeah, you you nailed it, Mark. The biggest challenge with the parables is having the correct understanding and knowing it, (laughs) right? Because... Even even growing up, I've heard these parables time and time again, and I still feel shaky at times. And so I think that's the biggest uh, encouragement in the challenge is that, you know, lean into trusted pastors, lean into uh, commentaries of other people and use some discernment. You know, it's very popular in our culture and even um, in other religions to make applications And assume they're true and say, I really liked this story and I liked that there was soil in it and it's good soil. And so I want to be the good soil. And that's what this parable means. And it's okay if we're wrong, if we, it's okay to admit, you know what? I didn't understand that correctly. And I want to understand what this parable is truly about. So that's the biggest challenge for me is not only trying to understand for myself, but then feeling confident and saying, Oh no, this is what God meant. And and I've only come to that because of leaning into people that know more about the Bible than I do and just gleaning that information. 
R- really appreciate those thoughts, Casey. And you, you talked about kind of the joy of the struggle. And, and I think it's, it's one of those where even as Jesus taught these, I, I sometimes wonder if that was part of why he did it is so that you would have to spend time really looking at the entirety of God's word. And in so many things in life, it's more about the journey than the destination. And sometimes it almost seems that way with the parables, that, that once you finally arrive, you're like, oh, well, it was the struggle. It was the journey that was the most important and impactful part. You, you mentioned the parable of the sower as one that can bring joy and also bring that true struggle and challenge. That will be one of the first parables that we're going to talk through in the the study of the New Testament. And I want to turn to that one for just a moment and think through what you were just talking about, Casey, where, you know, at first it might seem like, okay, there's these four different places that the seed falls. And the, the, the problem is, which one am I? And how do I become the good soil? And the problem is that's not the right question to be asking. It's not how do I become the good soil. It's all about the seed and the sower and the work that they're doing. John, do you have any thoughts on that that parable of the sower and just how it's sometimes misunderstood and how we can go in the right direction? Just to kind of give us a basis for studying parables to begin with. I think sometimes uh, we always view these through the lens of what is God teaching us. And, and, and certainly we understand why we would do that, but then we can make them almost uh, centric to us in a way that we forget God is telling us about the kingdom of God, telling us about himself and the way in which he works. And and so sometimes I, I almost think of the, the sower in, in particular, he, he's, he's recklessly scattering this seed of which he has an endless supply and he doesn't first check what kind of soil he's spreading it. I mean, from that perspective, why is he spreading it on the path or among the weeds? And then that makes you marvel all the more at, at the way in which, because of his grace, he spreads it, not to first see what kind of soil you are, but the invitation is to all. Uh, certainly, first and foremost, we think of that first as we better understand his grace and it challenges us to wow that his grace would be that reckless but then also it i think there might be some applications as we think too of of christian witnesses and as as christ continues through us to spread that gospel seed to still more to to follow that same uh, model of of recklessly scattering it to all Molly's got a thought on this as well. So I was going to ask the question, how did you uh, come to understand that that parable is about the seed and not about what kind of soil I am? Yeah, part of that really comes down to the overall reason why Jesus used parables. He says, I'm going to speak in this way to help you understand what the kingdom of God is like that it's an upside down kind of kingdom, that it comes in very surprising ways. And when it comes to looking at the parable of the sower, if we go into it thinking that this is about us and what we're doing, we are going to completely miss the point. And so looking at even the parables in the same way that we've been teaching folks how to look at the Bible, not that we are at the center of it, that we're the hero of it, but that God is at the center of it and that God is the hero. And as you look at the parables, that's one of the best ways of interpreting it is what is this teaching me about what God is doing in this surprising upside down kingdom that he's creating? John, do you, do you have any other thoughts on that? Just, just the phrase, the kingdom of God. When you think of that, I think of the administration, that's where he rules, right? So I think of the administration of his grace, the way in which God showcases and displays his grace the way it shows up and and i think that it challenges us in in the parables uh, another one i think of is the the parable of the workers in the vineyard uh, jesus doesn't always explain his parables and so sometimes they just he, they just like hang in the air and different people will have heard those things in kind of a different way so, for example, the ones who back in the day would have been so focused on all the things that they were doing would have struggled with that parable. Wait, why are those others who really hardly did anything getting the same? And for the one who, who maybe say, I, I have nothing to offer, it would 
bring comfort. In the end, that parable, Jesus is really saying he's generously showcasing his grace because it's a gift. And it really doesn't depend on us. But to the one who was trusting in what they thought they brought to the table, they're going to be deeply challenged by that parable. Thank you, John. Thank you for the great question, Molly. So why are we talking about parables when it comes to witnessing to LDS? Well, one of the reasons is they love stories. We all love stories, don't we? You know, stories are just such a good way of taking difficult concepts and helping us understand them. Um, Every year when the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints does their biannual conference, general conference, they use stories and illustrations and metaphors, probably even more than Christian pastors do. They, They understand the teaching methodology of storytelling. Often, Mormons will also use parables when they are communicating with Christians that are trying to witness to them. We're going to kind of go behind the scenes of a Christian who has a job of interacting with Mormons online. Molly Parsons, a member of our team who's here with us, uh, that's her job, is interacting with Mormons on social media. We put out social media messages all over the world, and Molly and Casey right now are really the ones that lean into that a lot. And one of the difficulties of that is they love to talk about parables. Molly, talk to us a little bit about the joy of talking about parables, but also maybe more the challenge of talking about parables. What, what are some of the parables that they bring up the most and how have you dealt with this? So anytime anyone wants to talk about the Bible, it's great. I love it. If you want to bring up a parable, let's talk about the meaning. What often happens when we get to conversations that matter is I will be given an example from the Bible that shows you need to do something for your salvation. Works matter. And as I was reflecting on this question you were going to ask me earlier, I was really remembering the parables of Matthew 25 come up a lot. So Matthew 25, this is uh, end times parables. There's the parable of the 10 virgins, the parable of the talents, and sheep and the goats. And with, if you want to read these parables with what must I do, glasses on, you can easily interpret that as you got to um, do the right things. You've got to you know, be like the sheep. You need to make sure you are ready and have your oil of faith in your lamp burning at the right time and your faith is um, all of the works that you do and the ordinances and you need to make sure you're using your talents they'll take the word talent and make it literal not an ancient money Um, take your talents and use them properly so the challenge is on social media is like oh how long can we talk and when we're typing and you can't hear the tone inflection um, and these are these are tricky parables. So John and I talk about these a lot. And I think John is going to help us a bit more with uh, how do we understand these with gospel glasses on and not what must I do glasses. Thank you, Molly. Before we we ask John to to give some of those insights, you you mentioned something here a moment ago that I, I think is really worth thinking about. And that's this whole idea of the parables not being about what we are doing but what God is doing in his kingdom. And we we had a a great quote from a a pastor, Robert Capon, from a few years ago. Um, He wrote this in a a book about the parables where he said this, parables are only true because they are true, not because the actions of the characters in them can be recommended for imitation. Good Samaritans are regularly sued. Fathers who give parties for wayward sons are rightly rebuked. Employers who pay unequal wages for unequal work have labor relations problems. And any shepherd who makes a practice of leaving 99 sheep to chase after a lost one quickly goes out of the sheep ranching business. The parables are true only because they are what God is like, not because they are models for us to copy. And you're right. So often our LDS friends look at the parables as like, oh, I need to follow an example. I need to copy something here. Well, I think we're so used to the Aesop's fables 
kind of mentality with these cute, you know, cute stories from Aesop, cute stories from Jesus. What do I need to do? Moral, moral of the story. So I think just our natural American mindset trains us to do it that way too. So John, how do those parables then in Matthew 25 really emphasize the gospel and what God is doing for us? T- talk through some of those parables for us. Yeah, I, in Matthew 25, uh, as Molly mentioned, if you just focus on works, these are all going to turn sideways for you because they're not really going to display God's grace. But one of the things he's really emphasizing, and I, I would strongly encourage you, try and take it through the lens of, of having a faith relationship with God, then suddenly these take on a whole new light. Uh, the first one that comes up in Matthew 25 is the 10 virgins. And it's very clear, just apparent from the story that there were ten, uh, five that were prepared and five that were unprepared. And you can go into the oil and the lamps and people di- discuss those different things. But at the end, what was the difference? The difference was, he says to those who were unprepared, I didn't, I don't know you. And, and I, I'm fascinated by that because the LDS Church Joseph Smith translation actually puts in a verse to highlight, you, you don't know me, as we've maybe highlighted in previous uh, podcasts, but, but that's not... The emphasis of this parable, uh, if you were to go up to a celebrity's home, right, and say, I'm going to live here for the rest of my life, uh, I know you, I've seen you on TV or something, it would mean nothing because they don't know you. And so uh, God's grace is dispensed through that faith relationship. And so that's really the one I, 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 I would emphasize when it comes to the 10 virgins. Now, when you have that faith relationship, then you think about, well, how does that play out? The, the, the parable of the talents displays the faithful use. But again, see that through the lens of when I have a faith relationship with Jesus, that's going to be reflected. If you take a closer look, a lot of times, again, people through works are going to be so hyper-focused on what these people are doing with their talents. But if you take a deeper look, you'll how, how did the... The one who was unfaithful in his use described the master. You are a hard man, a hard, a harsh master. Boy, that's reflective of a lack of, of relationship there. And so you understand why he does not um, use his talents faithfully because it's not flowing from that. We love because he first loved us, but without faith... It's impossible to please God, right? And then the last one, sheep and goats. I, I think about this too in, in terms of there was already sheep and goats split right at the beginning. A lot of times they focus on what they did, right? And, and so I, I understand that comes up. But the sheep never showcase what they did. They're, they're shocked that that even comes to mind. When did we do those things, Right. The, the goats kind of try and, after the fact, knowing they're on the wrong side already, uh, make empty excuses. But in the end, it, it finally comes down to where where do you f- have your trust? Where and, and, and when you marvel with the parables at the way in which God displays, showcases his grace, then you trust in him. The goats who don't yet know him... They already experience a separation that will just be continued on in outer darkness, right, as our LDS friend forever. But but for those of us who do know his grace, you already have that close bond. And and when, when it comes to the end times, we don't have to be afraid because we know that that bond continues into eternity. Molly or Casey, do you have any questions or thoughts on what John was saying there or other things on applying the parables? As you were talking again and again about that relationship, it really struck me that the hero in each of these parables is the the master or the bridegroom or, well, in the third one, it's the son of man himself and how what he is 
doing is really the main point. The main point isn't, uh, which category is, am I in, so-and-so in, how do I get in the right category? The main point is a lot more having to do with how God is acting. And we have that comfort knowing, well, we have that faith relationship. So I'm not afraid, but I do have a big concern for those who will be sent out into outer darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Now, a great way to really bring that back around. And I think sometimes maybe early on when we start to interact with members of the Church of Jesus Christ and they bring up parables, we're like, oh, no, not the parables again. But in the way that you just described it, Molly, it does provide us with a really unique opportunity to say this is Jesus for us. This is what Jesus is doing and just redirect that focus. Casey, do you have any thoughts on that or other parts of applying the parables in our lives here? Yeah, so I was thinking, you know, when we were diving into Ephesians, um, in a a, kind of a separate part of our ministry, but uh, a big phrase I kept hearing was order matters. And John, again, while you were speaking, it just reminded me if if we're coming and looking at the parables as, okay, here are the works I need to do, and then I get faith or goodness from God or what have you, oh my goodness, no, you're your your bakery cake is not going to be good you're gonna mess up it's all about the order you're not putting it in the right order so it's so vital like you're talking about to understand that relationship first and um faith and then see the parables for what they're meant to be seen for did that make sense oh absolutely and and i think you know just human nature that that opinion of the law, the opinion of the legacy. When we read a parable, we want to say, what, what's this telling me to do? What's this telling me to do? Yes. I so struggle with that because as, you know, devoted Christians, we love to, um, we love to glean what we can from the scriptures on how to live our lives. But we have to have the understanding that that is, has nothing to do with how God sees us. We're not going to live perfectly. We can't by his affection with good works or anything like that. So at the same time as I'm trying to say, you know, parables are not telling me how to do something that, that Christian who loves digging into God's word, I still want to glean something for how I live my life. And so I, I struggle with that a little bit. Like, how do I, how do I find that balance of this, this story is not about me, but what can I kind of take into my life from it? Yeah, John, you had a thought on this. Even when we think about faith, uh, remember that faith is a gift of the Spirit. And and so when you're talking in these parables about that faith relationship, that connection, even there God is the hero, right? Mm -hmm. Where you're saying, how did that come about that these people are on the last day standing before God? why is it that they were doing things and they don't even realize that they were doing it or that they, you know, the faithful use of of talents, it was God at work in them and through them. And and really, is that not another way that his grace just, just shines all the more that he, he stands out as the hero. So I really want to bring up another parable. Um, This is one that I just struggle with, and uh, I think a lot of Christians struggle with it too. The Good Samaritan, because the way that one is set up is, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And then I get confused because it kind of seems like, well, if you do nice things like the Samaritan, ta-da, but I don't that's not right. (laughs) Um, so I feel like I have my, what must I do glasses stuck on and I can't get my gospel lenses on for this parable. I I often think of the parable of the good Samaritan, not so much, uh, as, you know, look at all the good things that we can do, but it, because it was framed with what must I do to be saved? He's kind of laying it out in a lesson of law to say, if you're going to rely on what you do, think again. Because do you really love your enemies the way that you, you, you should, the way it's called us to, the way in the Sermon on the Mount, he, and he culminates, love your enemies, and then he says, be perfect, right? We, we don't. And so in, in, in some sense, that parable 
drives us to the only one who, while we were still sinners, Christ died for us, who, who did love enemies and, and to marvel all the more at his grace. Absolutely. Any other parables that you want to kind of bring into the mix here to help us illustrate the complexity of this topic when it comes to witnessing to Mormons or any other insights on how to talk to Mormons about parables? I, I've got a, another great quote as you're thinking just to kind of throw in here. Um, this Similar to what we've talked about already, this is from Pastor Lutheran Pastor Kyle Jones. He says, Jesus did not tell us parables to teach us moral lessons to imitate. He told them so that we might understand the mystery of God's kingdom. And this is the part I love. That mystery is Jesus himself, specifically Jesus for us. The gospel is Christ crucified on behalf of sinners. When anything other than the gospel of Christ crucified for sinners becomes the center of the parables, we exchange the gospel for the law. We trade a message of what God has done for us for a message of what we must do for God. We remove the gospel of Jesus for us from the center of the parables and we create a vacuum and we frequently fill that void with ourselves and our works. Isn't that really one of the, the things that we can actually do with the parables is help show this great chasm that is between us and God and that the only way that that chasm has been bridged is by Jesus Christ, the son of God becoming man to live and to die a for us, for us. Yeah, you said it, Mark. Um, when we're studying parables, I, in my mind, the way that I can frame it when I'm talking to LDS is, how is this story not about me and about <laughs> God? Chad Bird said, the parables upend all our notions of a God who plays by our rules. And that is so good because he doesn't. And so I think moving forward, I can't wait to, I can't wait to reread these. And especially as we keep going with the podcast to look at these in a whole new way of taking myself out of it. And especially understanding that LDS will be placing themselves in the story. How is this about God and the kingdom of God? And, and what, what crazy, what crazy way is this true that I wouldn't have understood? John's got another thought on that. I, one of my all-time favorite chapters is Luke 15. And there you have the perspective of, right, the, the lost sheep and the lengths to which he goes, leaving the 99 to find the one, the, the lost coin, and, and the, the rejoicing that happens when it's found. And then the, the prodigal son, the, the lost son. And, and, and we're all familiar with, with that, but just the awe of, the embrace it's not until he comes back into his father's arms that he he finally finally knows his father's love you know there on his knees and and isn't that the perfect picture of grace in every one of those one it it makes me marvel at the heart of god and the way in which his grace always astonishes the the way in which we, we continue to marvel at it this side of eternity right we just like jaw dropping it, it also is a great journey to take our LDS friends on because that picture of being lost, many of them think that, that they're not so far removed from God's presence. And, and so the idea of, no, do you realize how very far we were? And yet the heart of God that pursues them. And, and some perspective of that, too, friends, is an encouragement to us as Christian witnesses, right? This is the heart of God that continues to go back the one who reached us and the one who now calls us to, to still reach others, to, to have that compassionate heart as you continue to have these conversations so that they too might, along with us, marvel at, at the love of God. I am also marveling at what a narcissist I am because, <laughs> because I... I don't think I realized until this conversation that the parable of the lost coin and the, wasn't there like the lost pearl, um, those, I'm the lost coin. I thought I was supposed to be the one looking for it. I thought, you know, go and seek out God. And it's more about God is the one that seeks sinners. Um, and just flipping that changes everything. 
Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And I think it does even open our eyes to parables like the parable of the hidden treasure and the pearl of great price, where so often I've even interpreted those that like, oh, there's a treasure out there. I need to go find it and I need to give everything up for it, which is an okay biblical application. But that makes Jesus passive in the story and us the active agent. And if we look at those parables again as this is Jesus, we're the we're the treasure. The gospel is the treasure that he's after. And he's coming out to find us. And he gave up everything in order to get us. How mind-blowing that is instead. Mm -hmm. Casey. And like that quote you had before from, was it Robert Capon? Is that how you say his name? Um, it's almost silly how reckless it seems to us that, you know, here's a shepherd that leaves 99. Yeah, he won't be in uh, business very long <laughs> to find the one. <laughs> but how beautiful that is when you consider that you're the lost sheep. Yeah. I think one of the things that the parables do so well are kind of similar to what Paul's epistles do, where many of his epistles begin with a proclamation of here is the gospel. And then as the chapters progress, it starts to talk about here's what the gospel does does. So first, here's what the gospel is. Here's what the gospel does. And that's really what so many of the parables are about. This is what the gospel does in the lives of those who have been brought into faith by the gospel. And that's just kind of a, a powerful way of thinking about it. Gospel is, gospel does. John. And yet I'm going to go back to what Casey said here before order matters. If you focus first on what the gospel does in me or through, you know, through me, then I'm going to miss the beauty of what the gospel is, of, of God's love for me, of, of that he reached me, the lost one. And, and instead, I'll, I'll never really quite get to it. It's almost in the shadows then. If I start there, then actually what the gospel does in and through me is going to shine even more brightly because I'll have seen the gospel in all of its array first. Awesome. Thank you, John. Once again, that, that order... Order matters, doesn't it, so often? Molly. So I think we're kind of coming up with some practical themes like order matters. Uh, it's about God, not necessarily me. But I'm just wondering, are there other practical tips? Just how do I, where do I start? How do I figure out the main point in those types of things as I'm reading with my friends or just reading on my own? Yeah, gr great question, Molly. I think that's a great way for us to wrap this conversation up. So uh, in the Bible class that is going to be connected to the next section that we're looking at in the, the parables from Mark 4, we're going to list some of these out, but I'll, I'll list a couple of just good principles, and then I'll, I'll ask John and Casey if they've got any other thoughts too. But really, to, to number one thing about most parables are about Jesus and his mission as he ushers in this new kingdom. And this would have been a completely mind-blowing concept for a group of people living in a culture that for hundreds of years have been hearing about, oh, one day God is going to restore his kingdom on earth. And they've been anticipating this to look like a physical kingdom, that right now they're living under the Romans and, oh, when the Messiah comes, he'll be this conquering king on a big war horse who comes with a, an army with, with swords and chariots. And to show that, no, this ushering into the kingdom looks so different. This is what the kingdom looks like. Uh, many of these emphasize how surprising that kingdom is. Um, so as you read the parables, uh, both for yourself and then in witnessing, really think about what is the main points that Jesus is making, rather than trying to drill down into each of the details to say, oh, well, this, the, the, the rocks must mean this, and the weeds must mean this, and the good soil must mean this. Focus on Jesus' interpretation of his own parable, where he says, the seed is like the word of God and build from there. That, that's the simple point he's making. And then as you read each parable, watch for the answer to that question, what is the kingdom of God like? If there are ways when we are witnessing to our LDS friends to really bring them back into the first century culture and context with these, you know, Casey, you mentioned that you're, you're familiar with some of the, the, pictures of farmers. Not everybody is. And so help them understand some of those illustrations. Or when it comes to the parable of the virgins, what's up with those oil lamps? Why did they have those? And why did they need them? You know, talk through some of those things. John, do you have any other thoughts on just how, how to witness using the parables? I think it's also really important to understand the context. Like we brought up Good Samaritan before, but it, it's framed 
with the question, what must I do to be saved? And that now helps us through a whole new lens look at that, not as example or what really finally I must do, but it's, it's as we mentioned, uh, preaching of the law, uh, setting up uh, the parable of the prodigal son. It says there Jesus was speaking to those who were basically trusting in their own self-righteousness. And he ends on that note of the older brother who who really doesn't seem to have a relationship. Uh, all these years I've been slaving away. You know, he only has like a master uh, slave or, or employee type relationship with his father. Um, so understand the context that Jesus is often setting those up. And I think that will then help them to have a lens to better understand its meaning. Thanks, John. So, so far we've got order matters, understanding the cultural con, uh, timeline, and then the current context in which Jesus is addressing this illustration to the crowd. A- any others before we wrap things up or, or questions or thoughts from anyone in the group? Casey Scott, a final thought. Yeah, maybe this is just uh, from my own personal perspective because I struggle to understand these, but I would just encourage our Christian witnesses before you dive into this with LDS just challenge yourself to dive into it for yourself. And uh, Mark, like you said, the main question is, what is the kingdom of God like? And reread these parables that you've heard time and time again with that question in mind and see if your understanding is different. Um, you know, we want to provide the the purest truth to LDS that that this is all done for us, not here's what to do. And so when we take a step back and remember that, again, order matters, how many times are we going to say it? (laughs) But remembering this is all done for us. So now how do I understand the story? Awesome. John, final thoughts? Sometimes you have stories that you pass down in the family, right? And and they're told with such um, heart. And, and and I would say, just echoing Casey with some of what you said here, just let it just speak first to your heart and then overflow and, and speak personally, especially with our LDS friends in, in an emotional way. This is what God has done for me and what God has done for you and help them through that journey, through the outpouring of, of personally how you're applying it to, to see how beautiful God's grace is. Casey, Molly, John, thank you. This has been a great conversation. I don't know when the next time we'll all be in the same room for this purposes, but I look forward to it. This is this has been fun. Yeah, and warm. Um, and warm. Yeah, it gets warm in our, our recording studio here in Nampa. But but friends, uh, we're thankful for you too. Uh, thank you for being out there on the front lines. You are in our thoughts and in our prayers on a daily basis. And just heed that encouragement that we've been giving you today to, to get into God's word for yourself. One of the things we often emphasize in our presentations is this is good for us too. Um, anytime we prepare to witness, it's good for us too. We, we draw closer to our Savior's heart of grace and we just see what he's doing in our lives all the more. So... We don't just pray for you. We're going to do that right now. Um, so let's let's wrap up with prayer today. Gracious Lord of the Church, we thank you for understanding the way in which we think, the way in which we learn, the way in which we come to know things. And you're a master teacher. And so you used these incredibly powerful parables to teach us about what the kingdom of God is like. Help us to read these with eyes of faith you you tell you told the people listening that the the only way they're going to understand it is if if they've got ears to hear and and eyes to see and the way we have that lord is because you've given us faith to, to know and understand these things so help us first to just dive into your word in order to just see the marvels of your upside down kingdom and then let us Let others marvel at that beauty as well. Uh, We're thankful for our Christian witnesses. We ask that you would build them up and support them, embolden them as they go out and marvel at your grace in the parables. We ask these things in Jesus' beautiful and saving name. Amen. Thanks so much, friends. Bye, friends. Bye. Bye. joining us for this episode of Witnessing Christ. 
Witnessing Christ is a Truth in Love ministry podcast. For more resources, visit tilm.org. If this podcast and other Truth in Love ministry resources have been a blessing to you, consider supporting the mission to proclaim Christ to Mormons and empower Christians to witness by visiting tilm.org backslash give.